Nice. Um, cool. So today we're going to be chatting about um, another type of primary producer in, in streams, which, uh, you know, paraphyton, which we talked about before the exam, is by far the most important as far as like the base of the green food web in streams. Like it's the most important. But we do want to talk a little bit about macrophytes uh, and plankton and, uh, you know, a couple other things as well. So, in general, right, what, what limits are benthic producers? Like, what, what limits the, the, the distribution and the, the, the density of them? Nutrient availability? What else? Grazer concentrations? <laughs> yep. Uh-huh, Brian. Substrate, absolutely. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, pollution, which could include nutrients, among other things. Yeah. Absolutely. So, nutrient level, other pollutants, um, grazing, substrate. Any other thoughts? Yeah. Sunlight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. Indeed. Turbidity, yeah, absolutely, which is, yeah, related. It's interesting to think about how terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems vary, you know, like, I don't know, like the air never blocks the sunlight to that much of an extent. But if you're an aquatic plant, you got to worry about it, right? It might get turbid enough that the light, light can't reach it. Um, awesome, that's a good list. Anything else comes to mind? Discharge, yeah, the amount of, amount of water, yeah, flow, especially if you're like, a broad leafy aquatic macro fight, which you might be, depending on what you believe about reincarnation in the next one. No, I don't know. Sorry, I'm going a little deep there. No. Um, what kind of life would you need to lead to come back as an aquatic macro fight? I don't know. A really good, <laughs> in a crystal clear Appalachian stream. I don't know. Well, anyways, here's a list. You all said this. You all know this. But yeah, you, I think you said pretty much everything here. Uh, except maybe temperature. I don't know. Temperature just, it regulates pretty much anything that goes on biologically, right? Because warmer water, things move faster. And that was one of the little stories about our uh, Colorado example that we looked at, right? Was that nutrients didn't really lead to a big growth, ju jump in productivity late in the year because it was cold. It couldn't respond. They wanted to, but they couldn't. Yeah, thanks. So scouring. What do you think we mean by scouring? Any other thoughts? Any thoughts on that? So it's basically referring to like a high flow event. So like when stream discharge gets really high, then that can kind of wash out the substrate. Um, so that's another reason, like, it'd be good. We don't want to get rocks that are too small out there today to measure paraphyton on because they're going to be moved around and, yeah, it'll be fun. So, yeah, anyway, all, so all this stuff. We've talked a fair amount about this stuff already. Now, an interesting thing, an interesting fact, true facts about streams, is that algal cells of almost any species have a, a, a pretty much constant ratio of carbon to nitrogen to phosphorus of 106 to 16 to one. And that's called the Redfield ratio, I guess, because some dude, it's probably a dude named Redfield figured this out. So the consequences of that, and, and so anyway, so, so, so where do plants get their carbon from? From the carbon store. CO2, exactly, yeah. So, um, yeah, so they're getting it out of dissolved CO2 in the water. That's basically never limiting. Like, there's always CO2 in the water. So nitrogen and phosphorus are what are going to be limiting, and so they're in this ratio of 16 to 1. So, uh, so as a consequence, when the ratio of nitrogen to phosphorus in the water is greater than 16 to 1, then no matter how much more nitrogen you put in the water, algae, algae aren't going to grow more because they've they got to match it with phosphorus as they grow. Um, so when 
you have uh, relatively high ratios of nitrogen to phosphorus, then phosphorus limits algal growth. And the converse as well, right? When we have um, not necessarily more phosphorus than nitrogen, but at least enough that the ratio is less than 16 to 1, then nitrogen becomes limiting, right? Because no matter how much more phosphorus you give, it's got to have 16 parts of nitrogen for every part of phosphorus to keep growing. Does that make sense? So, um, yeah, so you can look at water chemistry and kind of figure out what's going to limit productivity. Now, of course, when we put nitrogen, when we put fertilizer onto our agriculture fields, we put both on, right? So they're both coming there. So it turns out that for most streams in the eastern United States, phosphorus is a limiting nutrient. So I don't know if you remember, like, the paper that James led us in discussion on, as well as the um, example we looked at in Colorado, um, the study from Colorado State. They, uh, they use what they're called uh, nutrient diffusing substrate. So you like, you get a bunch of auger, you put nitrogen or phosphorus in it, and you put it, I did this once, you put it in a little jar, in a little vial, and you cap the vial with like a little silica kind of cap, and the nutrients come out of there. And so you can do that and see what's limiting. So if you put a, uh, a sub substrate with nitrogen on it, and put the thing on there and it grows more than the one that doesn't have nitrogen. Yeah. Anyway, so in the, no, in the, in, on the other side of the coast, on the left coast, Pacific Northwest, and then uh, deserts as well, and a couple other spots, nitrogen is more limiting. So this is, what do you think naturally determines which of these two is limiting? Like what factors? What's the natural source of like phosphorus? Yeah, so rock weathering, yeah, <laughs> taking it back to intro. Yeah, so um, so sedimentary rock is a natural source of, of, um, of phosphorus. So if you don't have a lot of sedimentary rock in your watershed, you're not gonna have a lot of phosphorus. Uh, around here in our neck of the woods, we have mostly right, igneous metamorphic rocks. We don't have a whole lot of phosphorus getting into our stream. So because of that, you add phosphorus, our streams get more productive. This is why Benton Creek has like hardly any algae on it, hardly any invertebrates, even though it's like a beautiful stream. There's not much growing in there. So the red field ratio, that, that, that tells us sort of what is, which nutrients are going to limit um, producer growth. Well, it's also possible in some cases that adding either one of those can increase productivity. How would that, how would that happen? It's a little weird, I know. Mind blown. So we add phosphorus more production. Or we add nitrogen, more production. What gives? Did Redfield have it wrong? Did he just want to come up with a ratio so like stream ecology class would have to learn his name? So it turns out this happens because different species have a little bit different ratio. Like not dramatically different, but just different enough that if the ratio in the water is real close to 16 to 1, um, then adding a little bit either side can stimulate different species. So sometimes we find in streams that um, adding either one can stimulate productivity. Anyway, people got really excited about that in the 70s and 80s, figuring out, they're like, oh my gosh, it's crazy. You guys like how I use green here for the text? That's, you know, photosynthetic text here. Actually, if the sun shines on it, it'll produce carbohydrates. It's pretty cool. Uh, all right, so we've talked a little bit about grazing uh, already. Um, and just, I wanted to share, I don't know, I thought this is kind of a cool study. I wanted to share it with you all. Uh, so Central Stone Roller, which you all know well, grazer. Uh, but the funny thing is, it's competing for algae with something like an order of magnitude smaller, these little mayfly larvae. So we've got all different kinds of grazers, right? From vertebrates, invertebrates. That's all we have, vertebrates, invertebrates. So um, anyway, so this is one of the, so a, a big review study. It looked at a whole lot of published experimental studies, looked at a whole lot, lot of different things. And basically what he learned was in almost all cases in streams, grazers are gonna reduce 
parasite, parasite and biomass. So gra grazing matters in streams. And again, why might we have thought that maybe grazing wasn't really important in streams? I mean, we, we've known for a long time it was important on land, but how do streams differ from like terrestrial ecosystems? Besides the fact that there's water in them. On them? They're made out of water? I don't know how to say that. The disturbance factor, right? So when we look at the amount of algae on a rock, it might just be a function of the last time a flood came through. So because of the high disturbance level in streams, there's this idea, well, maybe biotic interactions aren't so important. Well, yeah, it turns out grazers do matter. Um, grazers, similarly, uh, are affected when paraphyte in abundance is manipulated. So, um, so there is a fairly tight relationship here. But what's kind of interesting is this idea of indirect effects among grazers. What do we mean by indirect effects? Any thoughts? Not direct. Correct. Brilliant. How, so for interactions, like if we, if we say two species interact indirectly, what, is, what, what does that mean to you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's essentially a variable in between them. Yeah, there's some variable in between them. So, so a grazer and paraphyton have a direct effect because they each directly you manipulate one affects the other. Indirect just means there's some variable in the middle. So when we talk about um, about trophic cascades and we talk about these different effects throughout the food web, if there's more than one variable, um, if there's more than two variables that we have to talk about, it's an indirect effect. Uh, so it's kind of an interesting study. Um, so in this food row, we've got paraphyton, we've got stone rollers, and we've got grazing invertebrates. We've also got darters. This is, uh, I think, um, orange, uh, I think orange belly darter, I think what I can't remember. So imagine a central stone roller. It's not that hard to imagine. Imagine all the stone rollers living in harmony. Sorry, I'm just going to stop now. Because um, they do, right? They live in harmony until we go and electrofish them. But it's all right. Um, so imagine a central stone roller living in a stream with and without this darter. How might you predict darter presence would affect stone roller growth? So that's competition, right? So when we've got darters, they're eating these invertebrates. They're not eating the stone rollers. Stone rollers are bigger than darters a lot of times. So you might expect these stone rollers uh, to do better when there's darters in the stream because the darters are eating their competitors. Okay, so um, so I set up this experiment in these streams and looked at the amount of paraphyton consumed by stone rollers and looked at sort of density of fishes. And so there were so stone rollers in the control where it was only stone rollers. Stone rollers are the fish called the sand shiner. Yeah, anyway, they were just, it was like the, let's throw in another fish just to see if it's a fish thing. And then these, oh, it was orange throat darters, sorry. And so the white dots were growth with orange throat darters around. I'm oh, sorry, no, paraphyte consumed with orange throat darters around, sand shiners and controls. And no statistics or line on this graph, but in fact, yes, this was significant that the stone rollers had more to eat when the darters were around. They're like, they're buddies. They're like, all right, darters around. I'm happy now, give me more to eat. Tusky beetus mayflies gonna be gone. Uh, and similarly, looking at growth, um, these white dots, this is, you know, densities of fish and uh, these white dots um, are up above the control here. So stone rollers grew better as well when there were darters around. So it's kind of an interesting way, like it's exa an example of a, like, a, like a mutualism, right? Well, mutualism, I guess commensalism probably would be what it is here, um, where, you know, there's some sort of a, a benefit to having a species around. And it's kind of interesting because people will ask like, 
like, why do we need like biodiverse communities, right? Like, what it, does it really matter if we lose a species? Well, we start learning about all these like funky interactions among species, right? And so, um, indirect effects of, um, yeah, of the orange throat darter on the stone roller. Kind of cool, in my humble opinion. Yeah, sorry. There, you, that's significantly higher. That's in case I forget to say something, is what that's for. Um, oh, and even more things that I wanted to be sure I said. Yeah, this. I actually looked over this before class, whether you believe that or not. Um, so I thought this was kind of cool. So moreover, darters or other invertebrate benthic fishes occur in most temperate streams. This functional guild, what's a guild? A guild of fishes. They have like a secret password and stuff. And a guild. What, what, what do you think this term functional guild means? Yeah, a group. And we talk about ecosystem function like we we group species based on how like what the, how they affect the ecosystem essentially. So yeah, so like think like grazing fishes when they say functional guild, right? So their ecosystem function. They could be important in regulating fish community abundance, biomass, and production in many natural streams. Because if the stone rollers aren't there, there's just more production there. So, um, interesting. Most of the fish that we have collected so far have eaten invertebrates, right? So this is a pretty, a pretty important food, food web link. All right, so uh, the fate of our benthic primary production. Where do you think most of the um, most of the benthic productivity biomass ends up? Any thoughts? Well, like I guess, like where could it go? So it can go to the grazers, like right? eaten by the grazer, of course. Where else could that biomass go? If it's, for instance. Like the stones get rolled over in the storm, all the algae gets rolled and gets washed off, and it gets washed down. So where does that biomass go? If you said downstream, you're correct. Did you bring enough for everybody? How are you gonna eat that with keeping your mask on? It's like a zipper. Zip, zip, zip. Then go a couple different ways. It can, it can either be consumed by grazers or it enters the detrital pool. Now, a little teaser, we're going to talk about the brown food web um, next, yeah, I think probably next week in class. It's all based on decomposition, super important in streams. We have a whole lot of invertebrates whose only job is to break down organic matter. They break down leaves in the fall, but even not, when there's in the fall, you've got, um, you've got, all this primary productivity is getting washed off the of streams in a flood. There's a whole lot of invertebrates whose job is to break that down. And that's what we call the brown food web. So it's essentially uh, a food web based on decomposition. So the detrital pool. So detritus, anybody know what detritus is? Dead or like recently, <laughs> recently dead organic matter. Yeah, dead, dead and decaying organic matter. Yeah, dead and decaying. Can it be dead and not decaying? Dead organic matter dead stuff. This is like a Halloween topic. So, um, yeah. So a lot, it's either eaten or, well, it's eaten either way, but it's either eaten by the grazers or it's, um, consumed by, uh, species further on down. Interestingly enough, again, thinking about different pools of carbon and their importance to different consumers, about a fifth of it. Does that seem like a lot? can be released from cells as dissolved organic carbon. That's a lot, right? You think like a fifth of all the energy captured by those primary producers. Where do you think that dissolved organic carbon goes? <laughs> correct. If you say down, if I ask where something goes and you say downstream, you're usually correct. But yeah, to be recycled. And so <laughs> The circle of life. If you say downstream in the circle of life, you're probably correct. Um, yeah, so it's really small, so it can't get grabbed by most of our filter feeders and collectors, but it actually, we'll talk about this later, don't worry about it, but it gets actually absorbed by biofilms and stuff like that. It's kind of interesting. At least I find it interesting. I hope you will too. Uh, okay, so macrophytes. These are So when we talk about macrophytes, we're basically talking about plants that are not single-celled, essentially. 
Um, so we talked already about why these are usually rare in loaded ecosystems. Why is that? Yeah, yeah. Most most macrophytes uh, have roots. Not all of them, most do. And so, of course, uh, just thinking of the streams that we visited, having an area that has fine substrate that's stable and stays around is going to be pretty rare, right? So current substrate is really what limits them. Even if you have the right substrate, um, if you get a high flow event, of course, it get washed away. So if we just think on our sites, these are not real super duper abundant. Again, the paraphyte and the single celled organisms, that's going to be what's most important. But um, in, some, in some places, these can play a role. And um, as our discussion article for today, we'll talk about sometimes their roles are other than just being eaten. So there's kind of four growth forms of aquatic macrophytes for those plant folks in the room. Uh, aquatic plants are amazing and they're super cool, um, but they're not, they're, they're just, they're usually not super important in streams up just because it's a hard place to live. Um, so it's kind of a couple of different ways. Uh, the floating leaved, something like a lily pad. So life is different when you're in the, in the, in the, in the water, right? How do terrestrial plants get to the light? Say that again. Phototrophic, okay. They grow towards it, yeah. And they get taller, and as you get taller and taller, yeah, and you need a, a real strong structure. So right, they grow toward the light, and they have a lot of real structural, a, real, a lot of real tough structural carbohydrates, right? Things like Lignans, cellulose, trees are hard. Ever see a car hit a tree? The tree usually wins, to be honest, right? So incredibly hard. These all these structural molecules to keep to keep tall so you can stay up to the light. Well, if you're in the water, it's a little different deal. You can get to the light a couple of different ways. One of the ways is by having floating leaves, right? So you can have you can have uh, you can have gases that are sequestered in your leaves that will float you up, right? You don't have to hold up and let the water float you up. Um, similar, so this is duckweed, lemna. Some, sometimes you'll, you'll see these kind of collected in stream backwaters. So these literally have little like rootlings. There's probably a more bot botanical term for that. I like rootlings because I think it sounds cute. But they look like tiny little lily pads with a couple little hairs hanging down in the water that they extract nutrients from. Kind of cool. These floating leaves, leaved uh, and emergent, however, both have roots in some kind of stable but fine substrate. So these emergent plants, uh, they say, uh, we're not in enough water to float to the top, so we gotta grow out of the water and keep going up. So these emergent plants, uh, again, have a lot of these structural compounds that, that, um, that hold them up above. Submerged, uh, there are also plants that do all of their gas exchange in the water as well. So, the reason that these, of course, are harder to eat than paraphyton is because they are transporting materials throughout their structures. They're not single-celled. They're, uh, they're transporting things. And so to preserve right, those transport structures, they have to have at least some, um, some structure, right? So something like, um, uh, like a lily pad with the plant there, you know, this is not as tough as a tree, but it's tougher than algae. Anywho, bryophytes are important. Remember the paper that Michael led the discussion on with the acidified streams? The way upstream, uh, you've got these things. These are pretty cool. So these, many of them can live covered with water, but they don't have to be submerged. So bryophytes, these are non-vascular plants. Uh, they're macrophytes. Uh, things like liverworts. There are some of these... Uh, that we see around our area, the bryophytes, these hornworts. These are, are fairly common. They attach to rocks, uh, but they have to be covered in water because they can't transport water throughout their body, so they have to like get it. Each little part of the bryophyte has to get the water from outside. So, so these can be important uh, in some places, kind of in headwaters where there's that transition between the wet and dry habitat. The thing about bryophytes is uh, they need soft, turbulent waters to photosynthesize. 
Uh, and so that's a challenge, right? If you're a plant and you need turbulent waters, it's tough because turbulent waters are going to have current. They're going to wash you away. So you've got to be able to really attach tightly to the rocks. And so um, if you, you know, like liverworts, for instance, um, uh, these mosses, right, they're, they're, they're stuck onto those rocks really well because they're not able to use uh, calcium, carbo uh, calcium carbonate, so they need very soft turbulent water with lots and lots of CO2. Moving a little bit downstream, we see more of the flowering plants. So they're able to photosynthesize in, in, in hard waters, um, but again, they need uh, a stable substrate to hang out in. And so these plants are a lot like, kind of like the kelp forests are off uh, of like California and those areas. They're really almost more important from a structural perspective than they are from a primary productivity perspective. They create a lot of um, habitat diversity here. So in general, we see like up in the headwaters, uh, more bryophytes. Um, yeah, unfortunately we didn't, we're not really We'll take a look the next time we're at Bee Tree Creek for some of these, but we're not really in true headwater systems, unfortunately. I don't think we haven't seen any. Whereas further downstream flowering plants predominate. In the middle, it's tricky because you don't have the stable substrate that the flowering plants like, um, but the conditions aren't great for bryophytes. So in the middle sections, you don't have a whole lot of macrophytes. Um, so this is a podostomum, the river weed that our article for today is going to talk about. This is what it looks like. It's in the Swannanoa near Bee Tree Creek. I don't know if it's in Bee Tree Creek. Uh, it's important habitat for a fish called the sicklefin red horse. This is T.R. Russ, who works for the Wildlife Resource Commission, is one of our grads. And um, this is a dam, Ella Dam, out on the um, Oconalufti River. Uh, this is a research student of mine, Jessica Davis, and we were doing this tracking study to, um, to find where these things go. And it turns out that this river weed is real important because invertebrates can live there and then they like to feed on the invertebrates and stuff. But on these macrophytes, uh, there's just not a whole lot of herbivory going on because they have those structural carbohydrates to hold together, not as much as a tree, but more than like a diatom. So a couple things eat them. I think Dossi, we found that you saw the caddis fly in the little purse, right? We had a couple hydroptilid caddis flies that we found. Those things are able to, those feed on aquatic macrophytes, they actually pierce the individual uh, cells, cell walls, and feed on them. Uh, another caddis fly can. Uh, these amphipods, they're, um, they're like aquatic roly polies, kind of sort of, except they swim, they can eat them. And then grass carp. In case you couldn't tell based on its name, it does in fact eat grass. In Nepal, where we were growing these things, you would have grass growing on the banks that would kind of flop over and go into the water. And sometimes you just see the grass going like down the water because the grass carp would be like, pulling it off. They're like aquatic cows, sort of. But most of the stuff doesn't eat them. The cow of the stream, yes. Um, so yeah, anyway, so I kind of feel like I've said this already. I did say this already. So these macrophytes, then relatively less of their, their biomass is moving up the food web through the, the grazers, and more of it is entering the food web as detritus through, uh, through the brown food web. Okay, just a couple things to say about phytoplankton. You know, we have specific species of plants and invertebrates and things that live in streams. We don't have any phytoplankton per se that live in streams or rivers. Uh, what happens is that plankton that can live in lakes is able to colonize certain uh, slow flowing rivers uh, and then um, you can kind of, as let's see, just a second, get, kind of get a food web going that way. But as we said the other day, plankton literally means floating in the water. So these things are going to move downstream when there's any kind of current. So when there's much current, you don't have any phytoplankton hanging out. <clears throat> but it's interesting. So when you go far, far downstream in places like the Mississippi, you do find plankton. You also find plankton when we... Uh, impound rivers and turn them into reservoirs. And river, reservoirs you can think of as essentially really slow flowing streams because there's a dam with water going over it. So there is flow, just not a lot. So we'll talk later on in the semester about all the different ways that impounding affects ecosystems. I think some of y'all saw um, 
my friend Jeremy's uh, seminar on the freshwater mussels, which where he talked about that a little bit. But, you know, so we've got a stream food web with paraphyte and then the grazing invertebrates. What happens when we impound it is that we create a condition that leads to uh, this phytoplankton getting established. Now, plankton can be carried on the feet of birds. It can be blown by the wind. It can get anywhere. And once it gets into this place, it gets established. And then it's fed on by zooplankton. So things like daphnia, sometimes called water fleas and copepods. So what happens as the water gets deeper and more turbid is that the productivity on the benthic surface goes down. On the other hand, because our water flow has gone down, we start to get productivity up in the water column, what's called the pelagic food web, right? Up uh, in the open water. And so the food web of our stream that used to look like this, with algae growing and paraphyte and growing on the rocks, and then crawlers and swimmers eating them off the rocks, all of a sudden we are at a condition where we don't have so much productivity on the rocks in the bottom. But now we've got plankton in the water that sits there and can get established. And so we've moved our food web up to near the surface. Well, there are lots and lots of fishes that specialize on eating plankton, primarily zooplankton, but some phytoplankton. These are smaller, so it's harder for fish to eat them. So there's all kinds of planktivorous fishes, um, things like gizzard shad, alewife, Whales aren't fishes, you may know this, but they also feed on plankton. They're filter feeders, right? They're just ginormous filters that they swim around with their big mouths and their baleen, and they do that whole thing. Uh, this is a picture of an alewife's mouth. He's like, hold on a minute, what are you doing? And um, this is the gill raker back in there, right? So the operculum is the gill. And so the way that these fish feed on plankton is they filter them out with their gills. And so the spacing of the rakers in their gills determines what size particles they can filter out essentially. So these fish swim around up in the water column, never go down to the bottom, and they're just going around with their mouths open, filtering plankton out. So they're feeding on this second trophic level of, um, of zooplankton. These are also known as micro crustaceans. They're really small crustaceans. Um, so it's interesting when lakes are impounded, some of the species that were in the river before are able to hang on and live, and others aren't. Um, these are pictures from Lake Texoma. So the blue catfish, these lived in uh, the river, the, the Red and uh, Washita rivers that are impounded in Lake Texoma. But this striped bass is a marine fish that is stocked to take advantage of the fish that feed on that pelagic food web. By the way, anybody want to hazard a guess as to what lakes, uh, as to what states Lake Texoma borders. Brilliant, brilliant. The most uncreatively named lake on the planet, Lake Texoma, the border between Texas and Oklahoma. Okay, uh, anyway, so it's kind of interesting. Um, all right, so I just wanna tell you briefly a tale of two silver sides. It was the best of habitats, it was the worst of habitats. So Lake Texoma was impounded in 44. It's actually, interestingly enough, built by uh, German prisoners of war, in case you're curious, uh, partly at least. And um, the Brook Silverside lived there for a long time. The Inland Silverside, however, was introduced in the 50s. After that happened, the Brook Silverside went away, wasn't seen much at all, it just got mad and was like, I'm out. This food up looks totally different. Um, and so there was a study that kind of asked the question like, why is it that the inland, inland silver side overtook the brook silver side? Uh, and essentially it came down to competition. I don't know if you can see it, but the brook silver side's mouth is, it's almost like a beak kind of sort of, it's, take my, word, <coughs> take my word for it, it's like a beak. Good for feeding on some things, but not good for filtering out plankton. The inland silver side on the other hand is very good at that. Uh, and so it, it is able to feed out. And so it looks like what happened was that um, the inland silver side were able to filter out specifically copepod prey, which is a type of zooplankton. Uh, and so this fish kind of went away because its food web was no longer present, whereas this one did really well because it was a plankton feeder that was there. Or so we thought. Then in 2002, rediscovery of Labidestes siculus in Lake Texoma. Um, 
it was it was found and it turned out that they were hanging out in these coves with marinas so out here it was mostly uh inland silver side right with the filter feeders plankton pelagic food rub out here water's too deep for light to hit the bottom but you have plankton that are growing here fueling this food web. Well, they came in here and it turned out that these inland silver sides that were still there, people thought they were gone, but they weren't, were hanging out in these little coves that had marinas in them. Any idea what they were eating in these marinas? Popcorn and, no, I don't know. What do people eat in, in marinas? Sandwiches? Well, it turns out that they were eating terrestrial insects. In particular, uh, at night, people wanna make sure that people don't take their boats at night. So they have lights on these things. So all those lights, of course, draw in bugs because they think it's the sun. Bugs aren't really all that smart. They think it's the sun, they fly in, it's not. Some of them fall into the water. When they fall into the water, they get eaten by the Brook Silverside. So the Brook Silverside was able to hang out in these bays um, eating another anthropogenically modified resource of terrestrial bugs that were coming into these marinas because of the light. They flew into the light. That was the last thing they did. So anyway, um, yeah. So macrophytes and uh, phytoplankton, not important in a lot of streams, but particularly when we impound them and create reservoirs, we can get this food web that transfers from a benthic to a pelagic food web. And, um, and that, if you remember, the whole thing about like why the world is green, like the, the trophic theory and thing, that was the whole idea about the four trophic level food web. Phytoplankton, zooplankton, things like alewives and shad, and then things like striped bass to eat them. That was their whole full four trophic level food web, uh, which is not green. It's often brown, actually, Lake Texoma, but um, that's kind of where that came from. Cool. 